Welcome viewers to the 26th episode of Beyond Phonology. Uh, it's Monday morning here, afternoon in Netherlands. And from the Netherlands, we have with us Professor Fred Kejer. Uh, uh, professor Kejer is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Groningen. Uh, and he has some very interesting thoughts. Uh, of course, he's a philosopher. So uh, a lot of what he has done is curate uh, evidence and create a a really nice narrative out of that regarding the evolution of the nervous system. Uh, and he has a very, very nice thesis called the brain skin, hypo skin brain hypothesis. A lot of what uh, Professor Kedger has written and remind me if I wrong Professor Kedger is uh, about the evolution of early cognition. So we have this assumption in neuroscience, uh, especially cognitive neuroscience uh, in higher animals that cognition is something unique that involves higher order structures like neurons and circuits and uh, different parts of the brain interacting with different kinds of sensors across the body in specific ways. But what Fred has shown in, a, in his work is that uh, you can see cognition and the kind of cognition we attribute uh, to humans uh, in organisms as lower as uh, simple bacterial cells. So even bacterial cells show phenomena like learning, perception, action, uh, and a lot more uh, behavior, uh, which you explain using cognitive theories. And the idea is that since we can explain these higher order uh, cognitive phenomena using uh, simple molecular changes, we need to change how we think about the brain. We need to change about think about the, about cognition in general so that our explanations are evolutionarily grounded and we have a common theme. We have a common uh, origin of cognition rather than coming up with some punctuated special mechanisms evolving at certain point in evolution to explain cognition uh, in certain species. So, uh, Fred, is it uh, a correct description of uh, a summary uh, of your uh, motivation? Yes, uh, it sounds like a nice introduction. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. So I'm very proud to be uh, in this show, so to say. Our pleasure. Um, yeah. um, ask me, call me a philosopher and that just upon a sort of existential issue for me because actually I started out as a psychologist a long time ago now um, and basically what I am by training is a theoretical psychologist and I was always interested in what thinking was and I in particular I remember from my first year that I want to, wanted to understand semantics what is meaning how can this be how can it be meaning in our heads what does it it seemed so unfathomable, uh, linked to consciousness and so on. So what I did within psychology was going to theoretical uh, psychology. And actually, that was basically philosophy, but much more ingrained and focused on, on, on mental issues. And from there, basically, what I was always sort of trying to assess this meaning concept and uh, I discovered cognitive science during my study because that was very new at the time, at least where I was studying. And that seemed to be um, much of a progress uh, because it was about representations and how the brain repre represents or our mind represents the world. Um, and that took me away or took me further for some years. And I became one of those who are... Uh, sort of enamored by embodied cognition, situated uh, situated robotics, dynamical systems, and these people were critical about representation as something that was not enough. And from here on, I got into a PhD which was focused on uh, sort of evaluation of representation and, in particular, ideas to develop it, move beyond representation. And this was in the 90s. Um, so I uh, succeeded in writing a PhD, so uh, I was happy with that. Um, and from there on moved further. And basically what changed for me was that I became unhappy with the human focus where we had this long, um, basically a dualistic picture of a mind versus nature. And I thought that was restricting how we think about these issues. So I remember one paper that I was, even looking back, 
this will always be one of my favorites, which was about some armchair, which was called some armchairs, their worries about wheeled behavior. Because to articulate this interaction between a mind or an agent and the environment, people were using robots a lot. And uh, in all sorts of circumstances, all sorts of tasks, and it was very much built on that. And I like that work a lot. It's also connected to dynamical systems. Then I stumbled on a book on uh, invertebrate, uh, invertebrates in general, say jellyfish and so on. The kind of task these animals were solving were so different from yeah. driving around like a Breitenberg vehicle in an arena and just doing things that are interesting for us researchers it didn't match so i wrote that paper and that set me on this whole track towards uh, simple organisms not if, before that was simple robots but then i moved on to simple an interest in simple organisms and what they could do and as you said basically from there on i was not so much focused on how can we make sense of the mind as we know it from ourselves, but what kind of interesting phenomena are there that might be precursors of what we have. And what we have becomes flexible, fluent, and something that can change in, or that can conceptually change for us, something that is not as tangible as we often tend to think. So from here on, I became drifting into the direction that I'm now. So uh, I, I, that would be my introduction. Right. So, Professor Ketcher, so for the viewers, uh, Professor Ketcher uh, did an, uh, a special issue in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B in 2021, uh, mm -hmm. which I'll post a link in the description, uh, which I'll be making the basis of the conversation to begin with. And he also has another special issue with Professor Mike Levin, uh, which talks about more higher order, organi order organisms. So I'll put the, both the links. So, Professor Kajar, I'll start with uh, the introductory chapter or uh, uh, article you have in that special issue. And I'll read a couple of sentences, which I find very revealing. Uh, and I would like you to elaborate on that. Uh, they're very uh, uh, kind of uh, loaded. So, it says, the premise of this two-part theme issue is simple. The cognitive sciences should join the rest of the life sciences in how they approach the query within their research domain. Which implies that cognitive sciences have not been you know, in synchrony with the biological sciences, life sciences. Then it says, uh, quote, specifically understanding how organisms on the lower branches of the phylogenetic tree become familiar with value and exploit elements of an ecological niche while avoiding harm can be expected to aid understanding of how organisms that evolved later, including Homo sapiens, do the same or similar things. We call this approach basal cognition. In this introductory essay, we explain what this approach involves because no definition of cognition exists that reflects its biological basis. We advance a working definition that can be operationalized, introduce a behavioral genetic toolkit of capabilities that compromise the function. For, for example, sensing, perception, memory, valence, learning, decision, making, communication, each element of which can be studied relatively independently and identify a necessarily incomplete suit of common biophysical mechanisms found throughout the domains of life involved in implementing the toolkit, unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, extremely loaded few sentences starts with an assumption or implies that cognitive sciences actually are not in synchrony with life sciences. And then we still do not have a definition of cognition and, uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Um, maybe a bit more at the, sort of the context for these special. It was one single special issue, but dispersed in two volumes because we had too many contributions. Yeah. Um, it, it, it just started with uh, a, a workshop that um, La Lion and I was involved too, but she was really the driver for, for this workshop um, on basal cognition uh, at the uh, KLI, uh, the Konrad Lorenz Institute in uh, Vienna. And we had a wonderful workshop where Mike Levin was there, Detlef Arendt was there, Kaspar Jekyll was there. Um, oh, oh, no, well, people who are very big right. in the field and maybe not so well known outside of, uh, outside of what well, I like to phrase cognitive life sciences very much personally. 
But basically what we did try to do there was uh, develop this idea of basal cognition as an empirical field of research, uh, not a philosophical uh, hobby, not something that is interesting for at the conceptual level, but just really a scientific field that allows us to make progress with understanding how things that animals and all organisms from bacteria end up are doing to uh, make a living, so to say. Um, when we think about ourselves, we need to ingest food and uh, don't get too cold or too hot and things like that. And this helps us to survive. And uh, in the human case, we do this as a collective, you might say, because I don't make my own food or I don't grow it. I rely on shops and so on and do other things in a wider range of people. And we tend to think of this complexity as the basis of uh, what we do or what it means to fend for yourself. Um, what we did in this special issue was trying to look at it slightly different, not in the sense that we take ourselves as a starting point, uh, what uh, Pamela Lyon calls an anthropogenic perspective, humans first, but a biogenic perspective where biology comes first. And the idea is that if you and articulate what is happening in uh, basic bacteria, how they grow into collectives in all sorts of ways. So there are sort of um, biofilms where many bacteria are living together and helping one another and sometimes eating one another, of course, also. Uh, to other forms of cells living together, eventually getting to multicellular organisms like animals and plants and fungi. Uh, and what changes in there. So rather than having something which is cognition, which is a sort of abstract, something that might be present in some organisms, definitely in humans, but uh, to be of interest there, you must be close to humans. You must like um, be a bit like us, like a, a monkey or uh, a, a corvid uh, bird or maybe big whales and so on. Basically, if you least set that aside, whether it's like us is totally irrelevant when it comes to the phenomena themselves, to what kind of processes are at stake in order to fend for yourself, to make a living. And things like perception action or a sensory motor cycle are present in bacteria. Uh, start to talk about memory there already in some form. Uh, normativity comes in because some things are good for you, other things will kill you. So there is the, in the environment is not neutral, and it allows you to develop a science of intelligence of cognition. We like the term cognition because it ties the simple cases with the human case in the end. If we look very different terminology then that would not be so obvious but definitely this claim is there is a cognition is relevant for human cognition um you can make a science on that based on so much information and so much scientific know-how of what is going on in the life sciences nowadays uh, that it would be such a waste not to use it and not to make this a much stronger part of the cognitive sciences than it has been until now. So basically that's the, I think the, the main agenda. Right. So it says that, uh, let's, let's, let's go, let's go into the basal cognition. So what exactly is basal cognition? I mean, other than yeah, cognition, lower order organism. Basically it is, like the phrase fending for yourself, um, it is perception action you might use, but that's a, a loaded term because we, we use it for our own actions. And what bacteria do is very different from what we are doing. Basically, the, the terminology that I developed on, in, my, in one of my own papers is uh, referring to metabolic core, which is say, the biochemical organization that keeps this living cell alive. 
uh, and metabolism is then the key is the center it requires certain additional processes that maintain itself by uh, taking food in excreting waste and um, keeping um, in an environment that is not too acidic not too hot not too cold whatever and right. i have a phrase for that which is cobolism i don't like the phrase so much but actually basically what it is it is meant to link up with metabolism metabolism is the can yes. is the center cobolism is anything that an organism does to interact with its environment to maintain itself so yes. moving away from a place where there's no food to moving to a place where there is food and being able to ingest it for example so right. for me that would involve cognition this involves a lot of um uh, again pamela's uh, pamela lyons uh, uh, work there's a cognitive toolkit also so introduced by peter Gottfried smith a cognitive toolkit of uh, perception, sensing, uh, capabilities of moving, normativity, valuing, and so on. Yeah. So focusing on the cobolic interaction of an organism with its environment, you are immediately taken up by these kind of issues that must be dealt with and understood. Right. So, so how big is the issue? So, for instance, you know, you say in the same article, quote, if the history of science tells us anything, it is that human intuition and tradition, which still too often shape the study of cognition, rarely survive scientific scrutiny. And then you go on to give an example, quote, these are facts that took decades to centuries to gain acceptance, but they make sense of counting scientific observations and measurements, have successfully predicted novel findings and are now embedded in scientific theorizing, unquote. Uh, talking about the example of uh, our long belief that Earth is flat and uh, you know the sun revolves around the sun, and it took centuries for us to come out of that paradigm, uh, and it sort of implies that this whole representational idea, which is the dominant framework in neuroscience, in cognitive neuroscience right now, uh, we might add be the same. We might add be the same cusp that uh, we are standing on a wrong paradigm in general, and what you are calling for uh, a shift. Uh, or a seismic shift is the change in the perspective from anthropogenic to biogenic, as well as going away from representational to non-representational explanations of cognition. Mm -hmm. um, I am uncertain whether I heard everything that you said correctly, yeah. but I think I have the gist. Uh, and this is that the, the claim is that we are anti-representational in that uh, thing. Um, and I was that from a very early start. So I was thinking about my PhD, which was in that gray. And it's also a paper which is written by four people, with slightly different views. And I do not agree as much or let me phrase it differently. If I would make a text on my own, some things would have been different. Not the non -rep of anti-representational perspective. And let me phrase it like this. So I'm sort of guessing at what, because I have not seen that text for quite some time. I didn't look at it before coming here. Basically, what is at stake here, I think, is um that talks about biogenic versus anthropogenic what i find a nice phrasing is a uh, uh, distinction between dualism and uh, naturalism and dualism i don't mean theological dualism but uh, conceptual dualism a dualism where there is a mind uh, it is not necessarily of this world, and in the sense that it is, of course, realized, and you can naturalize it in physical terms, but it is like computation. It is an abstract phenomenon, but which can be housed in many different places, um, and so it must also be possibly uh, uh, sort of realizable in a artificial forms and so on. And this is 
a way where you start out with a notion of mind. And the notion of mind is, um, I wrote the, the, the computational metaphor paper on this. Um, mind is something which reflects the external world. Yeah. And because it does so, because I know that the best um, food can be had in certain shops, so and so here in Groningen, and thus I will go there very often because the best food is there. That's representation in my head. This is a, a, a sort of conceptualization where the world is out there, it's given jobs, uh, computer screens, uh, Groningen, um, New York, whatever. And there is me in my head, representations of shops, Groningen, and New York, and so on. This is totally familiar to us, and it's very useful in a social context because it allows us to talk about the same thing. Shop in Groningen, for example, right now. When it comes to a physical organization and a biological context, and this is not self-evident starting point at all. Because if you look at the big picture of life, then you have bacteria and later on eukaryote, much more complex cells. And then the evolution of humans, or well, not only humans, of course, animals uh, into more and more complex forms, also plants and fungi in different ways. And then the idea that mind is about something of a reflection of a pre-given world that is then somehow represented in, my, in our brains. It's not a, it's a weird starting point. And from that perspective, um, if we had, uh, if I had, uh, say, a fly flying around my room right now, it wouldn't be able to see any uh, cups or bottles of water or a computer. That would not be part of its environment at all. Right. So a problem becomes not so much how can we represent what is given, how do we get at an articulated description of the environment in the first place? Right. It's a problem. We cannot start out with our common sense. 200, oh, well, um, a million, no, 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 that's too much, sorry, a um, thousand-year-old way of looking at the world, world as something which is given, which is real compared to the set of descriptions that we use to make sense of it. So right. we want to problematize, this is not in that, that particular yeah, it's not that, yeah. paper that you mentioned so much, but this is why I'm totally on board with the representational we cannot take the world and its representation as a starting point. Okay. It does not mean that representations cannot be useful in first, yeah. uh, some complex organisms like ourselves, because we can talk about our shop in this city. It's not, in general, a way to sort of to start building. No, it, this is very interesting because you you took a stab at representation at two different levels. One is the level at which we talk about in terms of how the brain functions, uh, right? Which all, mm -hmm. you, which you already took a stab in this article and you know all, in a lot of your work. And right now you're taking a stab even at the higher order, a higher order, you know, when people say that, yeah, we do not, the brain does not work in a representational fashion in terms of neural computations, but it does represent the outside world you basically took a stab right now that it cannot even represent the outside world without any reference to the valence, to the, to the, to the, to the biological significance of that external environment to an organism. So for instance, mm -hmm. a two liter water bottle doesn't mean anything for a fly. So a fly, even though it might have the same kind of stimulus on the eyes from that bottle will still not have any representations of the bottle uh, because it is yeah, not it a be... cognitively useful concept. Yeah, it would be the yeah. It's very von Uxkulian with his Umwelt ID. Yeah, but that's that needs to be refought and and fought through very much because otherwise it's a sort of very superficial way of handling the difficulties that are here, which are sort of I think also very much present for artificial intelligence right now in trying to ascertain what is an obstacle on the road or what is just a plastic bag and it's it is there is no world present in the artificial uh, cases that have been made so far. 
but that would be also it, it is a general problem i think that needs to be needs wider recognition right is that why is as, as much relevant to engineering especially in the current times as it is relevant to understanding uh you know cognition in organisms uh, in addition to humans yeah mm -hmm. i agree so so you you go on to say uh, uh talk about the evidence of cognitive concepts uh, and one of the arguments which you put forward is that uh, the, the concepts such as sensing, memory, learning, communication, decision making, uh, the of we always, of course, you know, attribute it to animals, higher order organisms, uh, and metaphorically to lower organ order organisms like you know you said fungi, yeast, uh, you know, bacteria. But what you are mm -hmm. saying uh, and emphasizing is that it can be non metaphorically applied to as simple organisms as a simple bacterial cell. And uh, and you are stretching it to even uh, earlier unicellular eukaryotes, mm -hmm. and you say that in fact even early cellular eukaryotes have the molecular infrastructure for capacities which we currently associate with these processes like sensing, memory, learning, communication, and decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, talking that we do not actually need the nervous system, we don't need to invoke the nervous system for these kind of behavior. Uh, we can explain that even at the molecular level. So would you like to talk a little more on that? Um, before going there with the nervous system, basically, <coughs> I think it is important that I find it useful to differentiate between ascription and constitution. Mm -hmm. this ascription is, say, Dennett with his intentional stance, and we can ascribe, uh, I have a pencil here to play with, we can ascribe beliefs to this pencil. It's not very useful, but it can be done. And if we would make have a robot, then description becomes even more uh, relevant and useful and so. What I want to focus on is that there is also something like constitution, which is sort of ir um, um, dependent of ascription. Uh, and that might be present in all sorts of cases. And what I think that we're pushing in the basic cognition issue is that when it comes to living systems, they all have necessarily certain capacities to maintain themselves over time, uh, not so much by evolution, but by physiology and uh, globalism that needs to be organized in ways that make sure that there will be enough food intake and that the waste will get away. Um, so from that perspective, uh, it is not so much that we already have something that we can recognize as something that we have and then ascribe it to what you may have. This is a necessary condition for being alive. And in that sense, it's also a bit I'm very much inspired still by Maturana Varela's early work and the claim that all living is cognition. I find need to sort of take this in, it needs a bit of massaging maybe, but this is basically the, uh, the, 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 the way of thinking that I think is, is useful and just a starting point for thinking about cognitive phenomena. And from that perspective, also, it makes it become self-evident to talk about the cognitive life sciences. And cognitive is actually superfluous to talk life sciences from this perspective, because it is always cognitive in some way. But you might not focus on that much. So that's the, it's not a big claim or so. It's just sort of a useful assumption and then again, if you say, well, the ascription thing that we have to humans, that's actually what real cognition is, then I say, fine. And what we have at the basal level is unreal cognition. Uh, they have unreal perception. So we call it unperception, unmemory, or whatever. We can still do this research. So the ascriptional level is actually becomes irrelevant, a sideshow from that perspective. As long as you can still have the not normativity and the not perception and the not memory and the whatever, and still do the research there. Uh, it's just sort of clashing with common sense interpretations, which is fine, which will sort itself out in the future when this research is being done. 
and the, the, the new findings will come, in, come out of that. And then you can sort of make more sort of size differentiations between what do you really call cognition and really mind and, and or not, or maybe you just find it all the same in the end. It's just yeah. not so relevant what we do there. It, 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 will be, it will be settled somehow. That's the first part. I can go on to the nervous systems if you want. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. Basically, because basically what you have then is you get rid of the common sense interpretations and you don't you need to be bothered by them so much. So you can say you become free to express yourself, so to say, in thinking. And what you then have is that life started out as, or the, the most basic forms of life that we know are, by, are bacteria. You might call viruses a sort of a special, well, outsourced. Yeah. yeah. It's a very it's different ballgame to talk about hmm? viruses. Talking about viruses opens a can of worms itself. Yeah. Yeah, but not really. Because that's such a nice solution. Because basically, what viruses are. They have a metabolism. They don't just own it themselves. They're sort of robbers that hijack bacteria. Yeah. And you must see them in that connection. So that would get the bacteria in again in some way. Basically, you have single-celled organisms and they can do certain tricks. They became complexified in eukaryotic cells, which ingested the mitochondria and uh, also plastids in plants. And there's discussion on this maybe. The aspects of the eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell, and they became very complex and very versatile uh, organisms, real animals, actually. If you look at pictures of uh, single-celled uh, ciliates, like paramecium, but you've got the stand for the sorts of things. You've got rowing, single-celled organisms, and it's just real animals, like larger animals, but single cell, so very di differentiated parts and so on. Yeah, but at the same time, when you look at the meta level movements, they're very similar. Mm -hmm. oh. Right. So from that perspective, um, everything is there already. They have a memory or some form of, yeah, forms of memory. They perceive some of them have certain, they're even uh, certain, certain cases that there is some form of eye allows them to see. Uh, it is totally wonderful. So the question is, what does the nervous system add when you come to, why is it necessary? And the answer that I like most is basically, uh, there's only one lineage uh, all over the world, because all, all animals come from the same lineage, is that as these organisms, uh, say 700 million year, years ago, something like that is sort of discussion nowadays. Um, they become they stuck together in epithelia. Epithelia are sort layers of cells connected to one another with a, a bottom layer, which is the basal uh, lamina, which ties them together and they're also attached to one another. They've got cilia on top or, and this allow them to you know, it, it, it must have had benefits. So, one of flagellates are the nearest relatives that are still alive of this, of our lineage. And they also combine in layers and they can bend and shift shape and, and uh, feed themselves in this way. And they can also live alone. Live alone. Yeah. Um, the idea is that what nervous systems did in the end was uh, allow the larger scaled or at least larger multi-component versions of uh, multicellular form of uh, life to organize itself and turn it again, sort of re reinvent all the behavioral niceties that were already present beforehand it's like it's an example that i like myself is if you want to build stonehenge that's a problem but you can build as a child with blocks the same shape without any problem because you can put them on top right if you want to scale this up 
to a much larger Stonehenge level. Then you need cranes. Then you need groups of people that start to work together. It is a really it it suddenly becomes a complex task. That's a new task that you don't have if you are a single child fully uh, yeah you yeah putting your wooden blocks on top of one another. Right. And that's I think where the important origins of nervous systems can be found. And uh, actually, it's not, I think that is not challenged or so. Um, ID or what, what I think is, is interesting, and in, you mentioned this, the skin brain thesis that uh, I uh, sort of developed already quite some time ago, uh, together with, uh, with uh, yeah, mostly with Mark van Dijk. Um, is that what you can, what it allows you to say about, uh, that it allows you to say different things about what a nervous system does and how it functions. So that it was useful for tying bigger, bigger or at least multicellular organisms together. That's sort of self-evident. But what the implications are of this claim, that is still contested. It, that's, that's more my own uh, idea here. So... Yeah, that, that makes it that makes it that makes it very clear. Uh, but the question is, uh, like, okay, so let's uh, come back to the need for that. So, and you talk about briefly, which is, uh, so you have this uh, mega projects, for instance, the brain project in the US and similar project in the EU, uh, mapping the brain, brain, and different kind of initiatives. So, for instance, you say, for developing the tools so that we can understand how brains generate decision making behavior in real time is the mission of the US Brain Initiative and its international partners, but we need more than tools, uh, unquote. And then you go on to say, quote, most of all, uh, we need new theory. It is difficult to see where that will come from except the study of simple organisms, unquote. Mm -hmm. so, so, it, 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 so you try to set up this as a premise where we are putting a lot of resources, both intellectual and financial resources, and trying to understand the brain, like they're putting multi-billion dollar every year. Uh, and uh, you very, uh, I would say, uh, you know, with a lot of courage, you said that uh, we do not yet have a theory or we do not yet have the tools. So what went on? Uh, so so what made you say that? Uh, uh, um... Well, I'm not involved in large projects, so I can yeah. just speak my mind. Yeah, yeah of, so course. To say nobody of course. Of course, of course. Cares so much what I say. Yeah. So uh, that gives a lot of freedom. So I'm yeah. not, I'm, I have no interest in this matter. Yeah. Um, basically, what I, let's go back to the representation. Yeah. Because I think that's, uh, been in this representation discussion since, since the 90s. Uh, and then it was, for example, Rodney Brooks with his insect-like robots. I, right. I don't know him now. Well, I don't know this work maybe so much nowadays. But the idea was that you could did not need an internal representation to organize robotic action. And I think the, the idea has been very much sort of developed by Boston Dynamics and the, uh, sort of the, yeah, the dynamical systems approach to robotics. And I think that that's very neat and very cool. But um, it is, it, you just turn your back on the field and then you look back and the representations are back again and they're there. And this is how we think about what the mind is and what the brain is. And we think we interpret brain processes as the sort of material version of what a computer does. Right. Um, that is, there's an input, there's an output, and there's computation in between, and you have a function, and you just must optim optimize that function. Um, that's possible. Maybe it's true, but I don't think it's true. And if it's false, it is very hard to think 
beyond this because it's such a self-evident way of thinking for us. Um, so one thing it's good to look at certain cases where this self-evidence is less sort of straightforward and then you come in the very origins of the nervous systems in the first place where uh, the stimulus response interpretation is not yet sort of evolved so to say and so this gives freedom uh, and also it enforces or allows you to think in terms of other pos possibilities because the brain is not just something that walks on this earth uh, just by itself it is always part of a body it's always part of a contractile machinery that allows it to move and there are always sensors involved so it is just a sort of limited version of what we what is actually going on in our bodies but also in mice bodies and cockroaches and uh, even uh, tardigrades uh, with very simple example yes we, we should and come back to tardigrades uh, in more detail yeah okay um yeah. so what i think is a problem a meta problem is 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 uh, what I like to call false confidence. Just being assured that you are right. Many people think that it must be so because there is no alternative. But if things must be so because there's no alternative, because you never even tried to develop an alternative, then you still might be wrong. And my interest is in trying to articulate alternative account of what the brain is and how it functions and what uh, you know, what this might be and what implications might be for uh, for the long term uh, for the say more complex nervous system so um, I go over the paper with uh, Gaspar Jekely and uh, Godfrey Smith in 2015 and we discussed this issue a bit between a more different interpretations of what the brain does and the first one is very simple that's what you most almost everybody thinks is a, a sort of an input output device where you've got sensors or, or, or sensors and you've got um, motor components things that initiate movement and so on and then a brain is a connecting device like in the Breitenberg vehicles I think right most people looking at this will know what that is so the basic brain is just a connector from a sensor to an effect. Um, if you look at jellyfish, uh, it's a, a basically a blob of jelly. So if you've got one point factor, it doesn't happen much. You've got a little twist on one part of the area. Yeah. And the problem becomes much more of how do you get this balloon to contract at one time so that the water is squeezed out and you move forward and then you expand and you contract again and so on. How do you do that? And for that purpose, when you look at uh, Midaria and uh, jellyfish, they have nerve nets which sort of cover the body and allow it to contract as a whole. Very simple task, you might say, not so interesting from a cognitive perspective, but a different organization that does something else. Um, and in this paper, we call this internal coordination uh, approach. Um, and the question there was, uh, well, both are important. That was self-evident, or you had, could find examples of both. We had a discussion about um, yeah, wh how, how, how generally important is this coordination compared to the input-output? Basically, I will say that the, the not so outrageous, uh, what's the nice word? Limited interpretation is that it was there at the early stage, but then on it was increasingly um, replaced by more input output organization. Uh, because we now have your eyes, I can see you and I can talk. And, Definitely, in sort of sequence of sensing sensory processes to 
all sorts of internal stuff and then external stuff. So the input output is back again because that's part of a more yeah. complex world. Uh, but I've always been sort of tempted by, or, well, worried about this interpretation because it's a plausible one. I mean, that's not, but it's also sort of going back to normal and then the, the skin brain effect sort of can be sidelined a bit. So from here on, I'm still trying to develop a more radical version of this skin brain ID, which makes it uh, something that encompasses to some extent in, in any way, in any case, uh, also more complex forms of nervous systems and even the brain itself. So it's basically my ongoing work right now. Yeah. Um, and at present, it's still trying to come up with the interpretation that fulfills these criteria. Um, used it myself, say, a feed forward or, or sort of uh, input output and uh, transverse signaling. And in the in the second half, there's a the, so going back to the main issue that uh, the special issue that you mentioned. Uh, there's a very nice to date account of uh, work on the evolution of nervous system by that lab Arendt. And it talks about horizontal and vertical uh, transmission. So vertical is from sensors to effectors and the horizontal is sort of, uh, yeah, the right angles with that. And I'm sort of in favor of expanding the horizontal horizontal dimensions of, of, of nervous systems and how this might bear out on more complex cases. I'll post a link uh, in the description as well to this uh, particular article. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, so I see I see what you're what you're saying here, uh, and give, if we don't do that, basically we run the risk of interpreting uh, almost uh, all neurophysiological evidence is in the wrong light when it comes to thinking about cognition, right? Yes, but that's that is really radical. Yeah. And basically, I'm not, I'm not arguing for total replacement, or that, that's that would be yeah. a waste of all the resources. That would be a waste of all this knowledge that is there. But I do think that um, things, some things might be reinterpreted in a new light, um, and that. It will have effects on how things go. At the same time, the whole field is huge, and to transmit new ideas not across easy. so many different people with so many um, aims to work on and and knowledge, and so this will be a, a this this will be a big change. So I do not. If it, First, it must prove itself. I think that's the that's the, the, right. the most important case. And even before that, it must be formulated more precisely and um, in a way that is makes it more empirically um, and sort of explicit. Right. And sort of um... so. So for the viewers, uh, you know, uh, a friend mentioned a chapter uh, on alternatives to the brain computer idea. So that's regarding a book. So we are coming up with a new book with Cambridge University Press. Uh, I'm editing it with uh, David Kelty Stephen and uh, Fred has an article on that in that book, a contribution, which talks about the early nervous system and these kind of issues and put forward an alternative approach to think about the brain then representations uh, along with other such approaches. And a lot of these approaches are uh, half baked. Uh, we still need more evidence. Uh, but the whole idea of the book is to provide at least a compendium of these alternate uh, explanations of brain and brain function, uh, which do exist and which are very uh, uh, friendly to explaining cognitive like behavior in lower order organisms, uh, even like a single cellular bacteria, uh, then invoking representations, uh, which inherently uh, have a lot of assumptions. Uh, so Professor uh, 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 Fred, on that note, uh, what do you think of representations? Like, 
let's say that to to understand the brain in an evolutionary perspective uh, or consistent uh, with life you know uh, with biological life we need a non representational approach that's one argument but th- does it imply the corollary that to understand cognition at lower order organisms we cannot use representations so for instance if my objective is to study cognition in uh, fungi and bacteria or even mm-hmm. like for example tardigrade uh, and i'm given the toolkit only of uh, a cognitive scientist uh, studying uh, humans for instance uh, mm-hmm. are those is the toolkit enough to study cognition in these organisms is it even possible i think what i think is important is that you cannot should not say uh, we should not use this to make sense of something that we don't understand as, as yet so i i don't believe in uh, in the claim that we sort of forbid the use of representation or that we now make the claim that it cannot be useful how would i know i'm just sort of this philosopher in this this room yeah i'm not knowledgeable about truth in that sense um what i think is important is that we should keep an open mind and i also find it um i think that representational terminology where it has its natural home is uh, in a social context among humans i think there it works very nicely and very well and in a sense it is what we share as human beings uh, in a culture uh, that allows us to talk about representations of something that you would also recognize as a representation of say a cup or a pencil or whatever that we sort of for granted as common knowledge um and i think this is sort of a very special context where we have grown we humans have grown together actually so i like to know of course the star trek and the war the resistance is futile you will be assimilated phrase yeah <laughs> basically um resistance was futile and you have been assimilated we are part of a large consortium of individuals who are not truly individuals but sharing so much of their minds and their thoughts and so on that this is really a special case where representation is perfectly at home the problem is when you want to move beyond this shared perspective and where you really want to touch what our brains are doing when they make sense of the environment uh you know that that's also why i think that it is so important to question the ways in which we will be used descriptions for the, the microscopic for our world that we use when it comes to making sense of what nervous systems are doing yeah. um because they are not third person descriptions uh, self evidently it's sort of we make choices as they out of the borg uh, that are shared by our fellow borgs if you want to sort of get to the mechanisms to the processes that move or that are operative in non borg uh, entities like other animals or plants or insects oh well insects uh, anything alive that is not part of yeah. our consortium then you will have to deal with it and then that process will be more clear there and so using representations in that context is something that strikes me as to sort of well i shouldn't try that so soon i shouldn't start out with it i should focus on the coupling the say the sensory motor coupling that is present there and how you can make sense of it at the same time we remain us so representations will be important for us because this is how we make sense of 
will so it will we will bring it to the fore i think also when dealing with these other problems not in a sort of self-evident way as is still taken for granted at present i think right no, that makes complete sense uh, and and the idea that uh, rest of the futile uh, you will be assimilated uh, is, is is very relevant out there and how in, how science works as well mm -hmm. yeah so uh, uh, so fred uh, you you gave very interesting pieces of evidence for instance uh, uh, you know in support of the uh, of uh, of your hypothesis uh, and uh, one of the examples you gave for instance is uh, in bacteria uh, that uh, you have this ion channel mediated memories uh, and also you have memories uh, at the level of uh, membrane potentials uh, even mm -hmm. in single cellular organisms and then you uh, talk about uh, the hologram which uh, were imprinted in the bacterial membrane mm -hmm. right so could you elaborate a little bit of that evidence uh, for that audience uh, which is very counterintuitive because you don't expect these kind of behavior, which we attribute to, you know, uh, learning and memory sort of uh, uh, being happening at the level of bacteria and fungi. And now we have evidence of, for instance, uh, spike trains in in yeast, uh, the whole work of uh, you know Edmarski group in in UK. So mm -hmm. would you like to elaborate a little bit on, uh, you know, some solid pieces of evidence, uh, uh, which kind of makes us question what a neural spike train is. Of what exactly is the role of uh, of memory in uh, in in life? I'm not the best person to ask this question. I must admit. Yeah. Uh, my knowledge here is very sort of cursory. So basically, what is going on at the bacterial level is that it has been shown that uh, in certain bacteria colonies, uh, electrical signaling is used to organize the activity of that colony, it's, as far as I know, what is going on there. And this was a breakthrough because so far it was uh, well known that in eukaryotes, the big cells, uh, basically everything was already exhibiting electrical signaling. So you've got paramecia that is Often mentioned as a, a swimming neuron, a single cell that is also a neuron and it uses the, uh, an action potential to uh, reorganize its direction if it bumps into something. Uh, but it had not been established for bacteria until fairly recently. I might get things right uh, wrong here, so I don't want to say so much about that. Yeah. Um, but the having electrical signals is something which is ubiquitous ubiquitous in uh, eukaryotic cells. It's everywhere, basic, well, not everywhere, but uh, it is a basic mechanism that's present uh, from before animals, plants, and so on. Um, two potentials are present in plants. Uh, that's sort of... In, established actually not i'm more an id person so when it comes to facts i have to check it always and i didn't check this so it's um must also be present in fungi because basically fungi are very interesting very complex um still difficult to study or expect except except for um uh, uh, Slime molds. Um, this is what I can say about this topic. Okay. And you mentioned plants. So when we speak about cognition in general, we don't think about plants, right? Uh, we do not have no. departments of, you know, like for instance, uh, uh, you know, plant uh, cognition or plant behavior or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so where do plants fit in in the whole talk about? Because you propose the molecular idea of biomolecular explanations of cognition and mm -hmm. you know starting from basically a a bottom up approach to cognition thinking from you know the the smallest possible organism uh, but when you start from there somehow in between come plants right so so then it is hard to argue that somewhere in the evolutionary 
history there these organisms which were completely which broke apart from this uh you know evolving cognition uh, and now they do not have cognition right but so mm -hmm. so we have to think about plant as well uh cognitive uh, at least at that level and then maybe you know manifestations of cognition changed uh in different uh kingdoms so 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 what's your what's your view on uh on plants here um maybe i say a bit about my personal history because yeah. basically started out as a psychologist, so uh, I can remember reading stuff when I was just getting into, interested in bacteria and so on, where I came across this old German book by Max Verworn from 1896 or so. He was talking about material consciousness and thought it was just crap. It was so, so much nonsense. Everybody knew that this must be wrong. Um, Basically, what happened was that when I came into Groningen, I had this PhD student, and it was on board with jellyfish and basic animals. I thought that was okay. That's super interesting. Yeah. But then Mark, Mark van Dijn came along and he said, well, I read about bacteria, and they do so much interesting stuff. And I said, huh? And so he, he explained it to me, and I, I scratched my head. I said, yeah, well. This is, yeah, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is super interesting. So I was sort of drawn in that way. And we published a paper on this. And then I got this email by someone called Frantisek Baluska. He said, well, if you think bacteria are consciousness, uh, are cognitive, but this was not about consciousness, then ones are definitely in as well because they're much more complex and so on. I again had to scratch my head because I knew from my intuitions that ants are definitely not animals. Um, and this took much more time for me to convince myself uh, because it was just a big, bigger hurdle against your own inclinations, which makes it uh, strange and weird and untrue that plants might be cognitive. But eventually, um, I turned and we wrote a, um, a paper together with Paco Calvo in which sort of articulated why this was the case and how you could think about uncognition. And I convinced myself, or at least I, I articulated why having a sensory motor apparatus like sen uh, yeah, sensor sensors and a motile body and so was not necessary to handle all the complexities that are involved in uh, for for con uh, cognition can be said to be present. So it is really what I think is the inter is interesting in a way here uh, is is not specifically my story, but that we are become equipped with a lot of. Uh, conceptions of this field. We are not neutral when we come there, yeah. but we have, we are preformed. And if you want to sort of yeah, accept and assess certain phenomena, you must step outside of this comfort zone and allow yourself to be persuaded and not so much persuaded, but also try to articulate what it means if you say that plants are cognitive because they are definitely not uh, playing chess they do all sorts of things different but yeah. it makes you more aware that uh, cognition can take many forms and that we should not um, abide by long standing ideas necessarily and that plants are still very different and require new interpretation of what cognition might be also. So it, it, it's really that you enter a new domain and your old concepts are sort of blunt and not really applicable and you should develop new tools to handle the situation. So I think that's one of the major lessons that I learned here. Right. So, so, and and you talk about that in your in your uh, special issue, right? Where you went into uh, Sarah Saddleworth's uh, definition of cognition, 
which has been mm-hmm. the 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 most uh, dominant uh, definition uh, and then you gave an alternative uh, uh, more in the biological context so for the mm-hmm. for the for the viewers uh, uh, i think sarah sarovers definition uh, is quote cognition comprises the sensory and other information processing mechanisms uh, an organism has for becoming familiar with valuing and interacting productively with features of its environment in order to meet existential needs the most basic of which are survive persist growth thriving and reproduction right mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and uh, you have a alternative uh, sort of definition more biological friendly which is quote a state of affairs is information uh, uh, sorry you i think you hit on the information rather than the definition of cognition right uh yeah, in, say, the, in this paper the, the the stress is on information on information yeah and you say uh, you say that the the existing ideas of information are kind of moot and the way you interpret information is quote a state of affairs is information for an organism if it triggers a chance in physiology or behavior relative to that state of affairs mm-hmm. whatever state of affairs induces a change in physiology or interactive potential is an organism is information for mm-hmm. that uh, organism so so it kind of uh, makes the boundary a little murky given that it creates it puts information in a more relative context right relative mm-hmm. to the physiology relative to the uh, to that perceiving organism and very close to the gibsonian idea of affordances right uh, mm-hmm. so so how does it actually play out for a, a practicing cognitive scientist because once you have that subjectivity into play then how do we actually study cognition because uh, we can have some gross level ideas we can distinguish species for instance in certain ways but within mm-hmm. species also we have a lot of variation across individuals which will af- again affect what exactly is information uh, you know the way you put forward uh, what cognition is so as a practicing scientist in the lab what are the ramifications of of this alternative approach for them because uh, as a philosopher one can say one can argue that you are in a privileged position uh, to change yeah. you know to 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 propose uh, alternatives mm-hmm. is the is the issue where you are sort of angling for is that a subjectivity involved in using information in this way uh, one of the things is yes uh, it, it is subjective the okay. second thing is even when you talk about like valence and what exactly is necessary you know to live or to survive or 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 more contextual factors it has ramifications with how we do research in the lab right in a very controlled setting uh, and how we interpret what we find in the lab so at the theoretical level uh, reframing cognition and uh, or, you know the whole idea of biomolecular basis of cognition is very fascinating by the same point uh, a cognitive scientist studying for instance monkeys or corvids can argue that let me interpret my way at this particular uh, scale uh, without reference and uh, mm-hmm. what you're saying has no ramifications for how i interpret cognition or behavior so i'm trying to find where exactly the ramification for a practice so is it a theoretical change in our standpoint or does it actually have ramifications for how we conduct experiments how we interpret results in the lab i find it's very hard to basically the motive of the, the ambition is that it should pay itself off in making a difference for the lab yeah but so far i am very bad empirical scientist so that's it's I don't see the, these connections, but I can say a bit. Sort of, I I wanted to say a bit about my current project, and yeah, this definitely this touches on that. Um, because say the we talked a bit about uh, evolution of nervous systems and how you might come up with more horizontal, so transverse interpretation of how this functions, and. Uh, I was sort of working on this for some time, and then I needed, wanted to make it more connected to sort of real life example or a real life case. And this turned out to be uh, having a point of view, subjective point of view, first person perspective. And it 
combined very neatly, but it turned out it was quite hard to do so. So I had this book project, which is called Blobs of You, so I like the title. It's about how point of view emerged or evolved during evolution. Also the claim that you can have an objective account of a subjective point of view. Okay. You can really make sense of what such a point of view is, what it is, how animals perceive their world. And this has to do with skin brain and sort of complexifications during evolution where a more cephala, well, where a brain evolved in, 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 in many lineages and where uh, so, you know, uh, sensory modalities are and all that is sort of brought together here. And the main yeah, question actually is uh, if you if we both sit here and both we hear language or speak language and we it ends up somewhere at yeah, a place or something which is very mysterious which is a subjective domain and the idea that I develop here is that we cannot continue accepting that this is set out of the ordinary world, that it is purely subjective and that we will never touch it. Because basically what is going on is we are fully material beings. Subjectivity, subjectivity, our subjective perspective is part of this world. So we may not be able to know or imagine what it's like to be someone else, but we can assess principle what it is to have a perspective. We can disentangle uh, the organization of complex nervous systems such that it generates and maintains seeing the world as it is right now in front of our eyes. That's the, that's yeah. the project. And in that sense, um, it is objectifying subjective first-person perspective. The idea here is that this is not sort of reduction or whatever. It is part of the general naturalistic picture. It, this is, if you are really believe science is the right way to make progress, then phenomenology and accessing the first person perspective from the first person perspective is nice, but this is not, we should not stay there. We should be able to bring it in with all the implications, because it also implies that science itself is done from this first-person perspective. It's just not sort of, you really have to, not just things as we know them already, and then we just make an objective first-person yeah. perspective. It is the implications of having a first-person perspective as part of the naturalistic picture, what I'm interested in. Um, and if this works, if this can be made sense of and really sort of articulated in better ways, then this should, in the longer term, provide grip on the kind of problems that you're referring to for how can we study? Because you're not limited anymore to can we imagine what it is like to be a squirrel or a yeah. cat or whatever, but we have knowledge about how this interaction of this organism, embodied, trained organism with certain stimuli and how it tries to make or make sense of it, of what it must be seeing right now because so and so. And that would be sort of a possible way in which a very abstract project like this might be ending up in due time, somewhere in an empirical context. It might very well be that this is much easier than I write, anticipated right now, or I don't know. This is my own sort of plodding progress towards something that might be uh, empirically useful in the, at some point in time. Right. That, ex that explains. Uh, so, uh, Fred, can we move to the second part, uh, which you did with uh, uh, Professor Mike Levin? Uh, 
where uh, you know the second part of the same uh, philosophy of transactions be a special issue uh, mm -hmm. uh, where you are talking about uncovering cognitive similarities and differences and uh, conservation and innovation of cognition you know across the uh, uh, the organism across organisms and you talk about uh, not just ion channels but neurotransmitters synaptic proteins network circuit circuits oscillatory activity and especially oscillatory activity as the basis of uh, coordination uh, even among uh, uh, multicellular uh, organisms up to up to humans so would you like to talk a little bit about that where you uh, you know went from these small organisms uh, to explanations mm -hmm. uh, basically to cascades which can explain uh, higher order organisms uh, as well yeah, i can tell a bit about it um yeah. Actually, we sort of divided the special issue in two parts, and the first one is more single-celled and, 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 and empirical, or well, not empirical, um, some more general uh, uh, papers. The second part, the focus was more on, uh, on nervous systems and the evolution of nervous systems and the uh, interactions between them. Um, I don't have the lineup at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I can send you the link if, if that helps. Uh, in the yeah, chat. sorry. I yeah, no worries. I should have sent it to you I, earlier. Uh, so I, I just... There, but it is sort of... Yeah, I gave it away. <laughs> that yeah. was it. Um, because basically, what I think is 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 nice about this part is the overview of attempts at yeah. Um... So you go to uh, you know you start with uh, uh, chapters on. Uh, flagellates and the ancestry of neurosecretory vehicles, then elementary nervous system. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, especially, you, you go on to, you know, uh, reference, for instance. Uh, reference is a very important concept uh, in explaining, you know, these uh, internal models, for instance. Uh, and you talk about reference from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, you touch on a very, very important issues uh, relevant to cognitive neuroscience, but from a very evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh... Uh, it's difficult for me to. I sort of have to line up here. I think. Um, Okay. Um, yes, this is better. I yeah. can't see you anymore, but I now have a sort of introduction. Um, what's nice? is that it is about a higher level and it discusses, uh, it has a paper on, on uh, individuality and sociality of vascular plants. Um, basically, this was sort of, sort of classic text that wasn't, wasn't sort of totally new. That was something it, to establish something that is also in, in other papers. Uh, what I want to stress is what I really liked about this was the paper on the chemical brain hypothesis by Gaspar Jekyll. It's in this, yeah. it's, uh, it's, in, um, it's in this special issue. Yeah. And what is nice is that um, basically if you look at the early history of, of nervous systems, people uh, focus on the way in which connections are being made between cells. And you've got the dendrites and the axons and then how they are 
And what uh, Gaspar did in this paper, uh, and also reminiscent in the, another paper by Moros and co-authors, is that he focuses on uh, neuropeptides and how they, these molecules are used as, uh, as a sort of global Wi-Fi in the animal body, where the signals are sent everywhere and are picked up by uh, systems that are sensitive to them. So the signal is everywhere, but it has very specific, because so many different uh, neuropeptides, certain cases. And so you have a sort of um, nervous system cursor, which does not have any um, connections, physical connections, at the same time can function as such. And one of the neat issues, uh, one of the neat possibilities here is that it is a precursor um, of nervous systems, but also that current uh, creatures like Placozoa, Placozoa, um, Placozoa are one of the most interesting um, basal uh, um, of animals that are sort of in between uh, jellyfish and bilaterians, that's all the m major modern animals, so to say. And they have no stomach, they're just sort of flat cells on surfaces, but they have no nervous system either. They do have these neuropeptides and yeah. uh, you can call them, uh, you can say that they have some kind of chemical brain from that perspective. So the text by Kaspar is, uh, Kaspar Yekli is really nicely making uh, of that, uh, very interesting. Uh, the text comes after is doing something similar, but at a wider scale. It's by Leonid Moros, uh, Daria Romanov, and Andrea Kohn. Uh, it's called Neural versus Alternative Integrative Systems, and it makes a similar point, but doesn't name or uh, itself as, as sort of articulating this chemical brain hypothesis, but it's closely linked. But that's nice. Um, then there's a paper about goanoflagellates and the ancestry of neurosecretory vesicles, which is the goanoflagellates are single celled, but so sometimes colonial um, eukaryotes that are the closest uh, single celled uh, lineage closest to the, the metazoa, to the animals. And they are super interesting because many of things that are relevant or have been sort of at the foundation of animal organization yeah. can be found there in the wild, so to say, without being integrated in an animal context. So this is really a nice paper. Um, but since then, more papers on goanoflagellates have been published uh, and one of my favorite is um, what it's like to be a goanoflagellate which okay. is this is really nice and fun to read it's it's definitely hardcore neuroscience i must or molecular biology i must say it's not okay. philosophy at all but it's still super nice there's a very um this okay what i'm doing right now just move yeah of course of course list. of course of course i mean this is very similar in 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 a in, a, in its uh, kind of message to uh, you know what it's like to be a bat, for instance, right? The, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the argument. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but basically, it's what the the, the Hawaiian flagellate paper that I refer to is much. It's it's about uh, muscle organization and precursors of muscle. The most what what makes it nice if you come from neuroscience is that it really rubs it in that. So much of the organization that we think of as special and particular to the nervous system is actually just everywhere in guanoflagellates yes. and single cell organisms. So your whole perspective uh, changes because of that. I mean, for the viewers, uh, I mean, I, I really recommend reading the special issue each and every article because it just gives you a new lens. As you said, you know, a lot of things which we think special in humans or other higher order organisms. And we have like special constructs to explain them. It turns out to be that they are there at the level of, you know, these organisms. So for instance, when we talk about muscle synergies in humans, we think of something special uh, and, and something special which we learn over time and, you know, with changes, the disease and things like that. 
and we do have their manifestations in in coordination of these contractile units uh, even in the in these uh, extremely small organisms and we talk like about in for instance in jellyfish uh, yeah. and it opens a lot of questions like do we use the same methods to understand those or do we really need a different method to understand uh, these phenomena in humans for instance uh, extremely fascinating uh, 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 articles in this issue to reiterate yeah Oh, well, I don't disagree with that. Um, it's also a paper by uh, Detlef Arendt, Elementary Nervous Systems. Um, this has been sort of a long-term uh, scientific project going back to the 19th century. Uh, yeah. But it has progressed immensely since, say, 2010. And uh, Detlef's paper really... It's an overview of modern ideas up to sort of different options for uh, the evolution of nervous systems, uh, the role of contractile uh, tissue versus cilia, uh, sensory issues, um, uh, the possibilities that, diff that nervous systems evolve differently in the same organism. So you had two at one time and they merge later on. This is uh, really nice. Yeah. Uh, this is then a paper from Gaspar Jekyll, uh, Peter Godfrey Smith, and myself on reference and the origin of the self. Um, this is uh, inspired by, uh, say, embodied cognition perspectives and the importance of uh, sensory feedback when you move. And what you can say about this in the context of early nervous systems and what role it played there. So it is very, very interesting, you know, on this note that uh, so in, in in human neuroscience, the idea of reference is is kind of foundational for the so-called internal models. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we can go on, you know, saying uh, uh, debunking internal models, you know, <laughs> left and right. But but the idea of reference is very important to, for internal models to exist theoretically. And now you have these organisms where we can interpret uh, you know, this uh, this mechanism as a reference, but at the same time, we do not attribute internal models to these organisms, uh, which is very fascinating because it kind of shows how shallow some of the arguments at the level of internal models are uh, from a representational standpoint when you look at these organisms. Yeah, maybe I'm too far out from the worry about models anymore. So for me, right. this was sort of self evident yeah. but I'm sort of... My, my literature intake has been changing a lot the last uh, 10, 15 years. So I'm not a standard neuro or cognitive scientist anymore, I'm afraid. But it's no, nice to hear that. By the way, it is said, right? Nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of what we think in terms of cognitive neuroscience, we have taken away from evolution too far. We're not looking in an evolutionary light. And once you mm -hmm. bring it back to the evolutionary light, you see discrepancies and explanations and where you can ground that much more evolutionarily. Yeah, yeah, because basically I didn't say much about that particular thing that we are critical about evolution no. in... Right. No, it, it, it's, 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 it's my words here. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it, it's okay. I, I understand why. Um, but it's nice about different perspectives and bringing them together because you see your own sort of limitations or sort of forces uh, or also because some... One else doesn't knows what you don't, and other and the other way around. So I think this is in this sense is definitely a nice special issue to, to right. go through if you are not familiar with this stuff. Done. So, going back to my list, um, and there's a paper on evolutionary transitions in learning and cognition from uh, Imona Ginsberg and Eva Jablonka. Yeah. Uh, they're very famous right now for uh, the evolution of the sensitive soul and the origin of nervous system. And in this paper, they sort of comment on issues that are already there. It's about the central role for unlimited adaptive learning for consciousness as, as a sign for, for consciousness. And here they um, make certain points about that general issue. Uh, moving on to a separate section, which is called the cognitive lens. Um, the first one is by, now uh, he's the last author, Mike Levin, 
uh, he is a phenomenon and just uh, yeah, he writes so much so you cannot read everything he wrote um here he focuses on bistability of somatic pattern memory stochastic outcomes in bioelectric circuits circuits underlying regeneration um that is a mouthful basically what i would like to say here is that uh, Mike Levin's work is about biocomputational processes in your body. It is about the way in which all kinds of electrical signaling taking place, also chemical, of course, but it's focusing on that as a way of computing the body and organization of the body and how you can change it by... Um, manipulating the programming that our bodies use to maintain themselves with a specific kind of head, a specific kind of bodily organization and so forth. So it is super interesting because we tend to think of the brain as a place where computation takes place and the rest is sort of fleshy soup. It's a bit strong, um, but still, and what Mike Levin shows in his work, uh, which is everywhere and what he does is that actually it is a major computational task to generate a body, maintain a body, and regenerate the body. Uh, when things go wrong, when something is is sort of uh, when something is hurt or or, or or disappearing or so on. But this is really important from that level. Um, and the final paper is from Kitty Bentley. I don't have her name because uh, this is from a, a big group. Um, but this must be heard because it's, yeah, active perception during the angiogenesis, filopedia speed up notch selection of tip cells in silicio and in vivo. Um, this is a work headed by Katie Bentley, Kate Bentley nowadays. Um, it's wonderful. It is about, uh, she's coming from ecological uh, psychology, so to yeah. say. And she applies ecological insights in affordances to the growth of um, the blood um, vessels uh, during conditions of, of where, say, a cancer context where they grow in certain ways which are different from normal growth. And the whole idea here is that um, ecological principles of perception, action, interaction, can be used in her uh, really uh, sort right. of way of making sense of the developments at the, the level of blood cells. Right. So it's a form where embodied cognition becomes embodied and you really apply psychology to the blood vessel level. Right. I really like that one. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful article as well as it goes into the dynamic systems uh, arguments, uh, you know, regarding bi-stability bi paradigms and, you know, uh, the Wellington landscape kind of ideas when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, uh, in both in vivo and in silico explanations uh, at at uh, at uh, at this developmental level in Philopedias. Yeah, I was very happy with that one. Yeah, and it's a beautiful article which goes both into empirical and theoretical domain. And yeah, she does also experiments in uh, silicio. Yeah, uh, that's it. So yeah, Professor Gajwa, this is uh, this is actually wonderful. So uh, where actually are we heading now? So given how we know, you know, you know all this evidence. So where do we really need to uh, reshape or rethink uh, what we are doing in cognition, according to you? So, so for, so for instance, if I, as a human cognitive scientist, uh, ask you for some of the recommendations. Uh, and you already have acknowledged that you have moved away from human literature more towards this literature in the last two decades. So where do you find a room for influencing uh, how we do research or how we come up with cognitive explanations uh, in my world? I find it a very difficult question um, because it's a very volatile world and yeah. things are happening within this field, but also outside with, of course, uh, the, the, the rise of uh, AI, which is sort of super interesting in many ways, but also, yeah, this 
conceptually not it's very smart what is being done but i find it less interesting when it comes to making sense of how brains operate and what they do um but this might be sort of my own limitation here but i don't what I think the promise here is that it will not be a takeover. I don't think that people interested in neuroscience will. It's also, you ask me the question, what can someone in a psychology laboratorium do with what I was saying? I think that is difficult to make hard that there is, but I'm not the person to ask that maybe. There is a mismatch, I think. So what I think that is might go on to happen is that research that's centered in the special issue is super interesting and will more than be able to fend for itself. From here on, um, make something like cognitive life sciences or a cognitive approach or whatever. Uh, allows us to make much more sense of how our bodies are organized and maintained and how you might do, well, solve uh, cancer is a big word, but still how you can help to regenerate difficult things. So it will be major science from here on. Um, what I also think is then it comes to say, more standard cognitive neuroscience is that it is a big gap. At the same time, I love the work by uh, Paul Sisek with his uh, papers on well, criticizing our standard interpretation of what the brain is and how it functions and needs to come up with different theory, theorizing about uh, yeah, the mind is in the first place and how it functions and how it might work. Um, and I think there will be options to use insights from this field in a more general way and bring them out to work there. That's not my focus so far. I'm sort of, right now it, it is what I said, is this first person perspective and we're sort of more articulated interpretation of what the brain is from this perspective. And that's right. still ongoing and the book is not done yet. No, that is very humble of you. Hmm? That is very humble of you, given how much, uh, you know, I feel uh, the impact with, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, all the evidence which you, uh, you know, portray in your work uh, and the arguments you make, uh, at least, uh, the very least we can do is uh, we can think when we come up with the cognitive explanations that whether it is not consistent, whether it contradicts, you know, the evolutionary uh, uh, ideas uh, mm -hmm. and drop them and, and keep our hypothesis parsimonious, uh, at least from an evolutionary standpoint. And not invoke concepts which cannot be implemented, you know, at this level, uh, which seem to be remote because then they, they, they necessarily are some kind of, you know, philosophical baggage rather than actually talking about what is happening in the body and the brain and mm. in the nervous system. I have one thing. Yeah. What I think is sort of, uh, it's a negative. Yeah. <laughs> a negative. Basically, what I think that anyone can learn from this field yeah. is that you must adapt. And that um, actually we have a, Perception of the mind and the brain, which is going back centuries, which has not been informed by no. all the new knowledge from the last uh, hundred, leave alone the last 20 years. And the only way in which you can sort of move on is by being humble or right. being aware that things must be different and, and that changes must be made and that nobody really knows how to do this, but have an open mind that this is the case and that, uh, yeah, for the, the, the reason why uh, there is a replication crisis, we call just one thing, um, 
is that we need better accounts of what is going on. And we have this field within sort of life sciences where uh, really progress is being made. And this might be helpful in some way. So keep an eye. So be open to change. I think that's yeah. that's the main message that I think would apply to anyone uh, working on. No, it's 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 very relevant to cognitive neuroscience or cognition and neuroscience and whole behavioral science in general because we have been stuck with the representational ideas for more than a century and almost all major paradigms and the way we interpret our data. I mean, we are so advanced now in how much data we collect. Data is so cheap and so good uh, and so high fidelity uh, and it will be no, no service to, you know, to that kind of uh, uh, breakthroughs if we actually have the same old interpretations, even when we have so enriched data. So, mm -hmm. so we should, we should be more humble and uh, be open to these new possibilities uh, with what fascinating data we are stumbling on right now. Yeah. Hey. Uh, Applaud. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Fred, for uh, for a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, I do recommend this special issue uh, for everyone interested in cognition to read, no matter uh, at what level you are doing cognition. Uh, and Fred, I look forward to your uh, to publishing our book. Uh, we already have the contract. Uh, hopefully, uh, there are a few authors we are still waiting on the chapters. Uh, sorry, it's been late. So hopefully, by the end of this year, uh, we'll have the book uh, uh, in press, and next yeah, year we'll guys. have it in print. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks for this. Have a nice day ahead. Yeah. Bye bye. And you goodbye. Bye.